Um, now, as you were sort of alluding to before, and the, the International Mathematical Olympiad is kind of embodies this idea, you're someone who knows and relishes the power of a good problem. It, you know, a problem is not just um, for the sake of getting an answer. In fact, usually, um, in many cases, the answer is not really the point. It's, it's what you had to, you know, the acrobatics you had to do in your mind to get to that, to devise a solution. Uh, and so that's why one of the things I love that you do is you pose these daily challenges and you post them up online for people to participate in. Um, and that was actually something which got you a lot of attention, uh, sort of, you know, early, late 2019, I think it was, um, because through posing one of those challenges, you actually came up with a result about quadratic equations and tr trying to solve quadratic equations. Um, now, for those of the, our viewers who, you know, some of them are a bit younger, they've not met quadratic equations before, um, but these objects, these mathematical um, items, they've fascinated humanity for millennia. You know, the Babylonians, the ancient Greeks, Egyptians, Chinese, Indians, all over. Uh, my question sort of as an introduction to you, without getting into too many of the nitty gritty details is, why have humans been so interested in these quadratic equations? Why are they so useful? Oh, I think the reason why people have been interested in quadratic equations is because they're hard. In the sense that, what I mean is, there's some easy equations like 3x equals 6. You just undo the 3. You were going to multiply by 3, then unmultiply, just divide. That's not hard. Or x plus 2 equals 5. Just unplus the 2. That's reasonable. But now the quadratic equation was strange because it's very hard to undo x squared plus x plus 6 equals 0. How do you un that? You don't. And so I think people have always been fascinated by whatever is at the fringe of what they can barely, what they can do and what's just on the fringe of what they can't do. So I think that's why that's been there. And also, of course, they've been practical. I mean, if you had a field, for, for example, and you know the perimeter of the field and the area of the field, and it's a rectangle, well, then how would you, how would you figure out the dimensions? That turns out to be related to quadratic equations, too. Hmm, got it. So there's kind of these two aspects to it, right? It is, there is this practical sense, but they're also sort of delightful objects of their own. You know, I guess it sort of speaks to the fact that, um, you know, newspapers uh, around the world, they will often publish, you know, uh, crossword puzzles or, or sudokus or things like that. And we actually, there's something in every human being that's like, I like to wrestle with something that's a little bit interesting, a little bit challenging. So as you were, you know, working on this uh, daily challenge of yours that involved a quadratic equation, um, it came about that you devised this new method. And we won't go into um, the nuts and bolts now because people can go and, and search that up. And it is fascinating because it's part of what the majority of people around the world will have learned some way to solve a quadratic equation. May have forgotten it by now, but it's still kicking around somewhere in their memory. What I'm interested from your perspective is how did it feel um, as you were devising a new method and when you described, uh, sorry, when you discovered, wait a second, this is not something that I've met before. What, what was the sensation going through you at that point? Oh my gosh, when I came up with this way that I had never seen before, I basically fell out of my chair because I, my job is to teach, right? So in some sense, and I also coach Olympiads, right? So my job is to know as many of the methods that there could possibly be. And as that rebel, I always love doing things in different ways. So I have actually always been trying to find different ways to do anything just for the heck of it. Uh, and then when I found this way, I just thought, how come I've never seen this before? Because I, I can tell you how it came about. The reason is because I was trying to find a way to explain to very young people how to solve quadratic equations. And I had first experimented with this with some elementary school kids, actually. And I tried to explain it to them with the traditional method, which is based on completing the square. And that's when I found out that for first time learners, especially young students, doing a lot of algebraic manipulations with lots of formulas is actually difficult compared to, let's say, for us teachers. If we were used to manipulating so much, you're like, of course, you expand the brackets like this. But for younger people, the expand the brackets like this, we just learned it, <laughs> right? Right, so then, so then I was trying to come up with some different way to maybe try to teach this in a different way. And I found out that you could solve one particular quadratic equation one way, and then it just occurred to me you can solve all of them that way. And then I just got super excited. Because for us, as I said, what we care about is finding new ways to do things. By the way, in the end, I found out it wasn't new at all. Babylonians had done this this way. Uh, maybe Babylonians didn't use x and x squared because they didn't know what variables were in the same way, so they didn't really do it this way. But the heart of the strategy was based on how Babylonians figured out the dimensions of a field given the area and the perimeter. So it's like we sort of knew this technique for 3,000 years, but it 
didn't make it into any textbooks. And it's really funny because there is this story of mathematics being this immensely uh, international and historical uh, discipline because in some senses it doesn't matter whether you are speaking uh, English or uh, Babylonian or any other language, the mathematics underneath those realities and patterns and numbers are in a real sense universal. I just think that's fantastic. So I just wanted to come back to something you said earlier, you know, I'm thinking about everyone who's watching uh, who finds math mathematics, you know, inscrutable and opaque and, you know, we're using words like beautiful or, or elegant when we think about this particular solution method. What is it that makes a particular way of solving a problem elegant versus some other method that you might find. It doesn't have to be quadratic equations. Um, how would you describe the difference between those? Oh, I, I would say if you use what we're trying to do with math is we're trying to look at things from different angles. And sometimes when you look at it just from the right perspective, everything lines up and fits together. I actually feel that's the main value that math often gives. Some people think of math as what you do when you calculate out answers, but to me that's just the routine part. The interesting thing is, well, I could either do a lot of brute force that way, or if I looked at it this way, it turns out that everything is symmetric somehow and it all fits together. Yes, I think that's fantastic. And it's it's like you said, I remember a, um, a quote I read once that, you know, computation is to mathematics the way that spelling is to literature. It's kind of like, well, yes, that's, that's a part of it, but it is a very, very small, narrow part of it, isn't it? It's kind of like the, the precursor or the necessary thing and where the interesting stuff is happening is actually elsewhere. So I think it's really quite obvious why you, know, you would head down into this rabbit hole of mathematics professionally now. And I'd, I'd love to talk to you about what life has been like as an academic, because um, this is something which most of us, again, look at from the outside. Now, um, we should point out as well that not only do you work in a university, but you've had quite a university career. I mean, you um, studied first at Caltech, the California Institute uh, of Technology, and then you um, did some study in the UK at Cambridge University um, before coming back to, to, to the US for, for Princeton. Um, now, you've gone to the other side of, you know, um, being the student to now being the teacher and, and also sort of researching and that kind of thing. Could you give us a sense, like what's, what's a normal day like for you? Um, is there such a thing as a normal um, day in the life of an academic? Ah, so this is interesting because a lot of times people will think of what does a professor do and if you look at the movies, the professor is this bumbling person who is supposed to teach incompre in, like incomprehensibly. That's not exactly what professors are supposed to do. Um, at the university where I work, what we do is we have a blend between teaching, of course, I'll do some of that later today still, uh, as well as the responsibility is to contribute something to the knowledge of humankind. And that, that's, that's what research is about, right? The, the main point is to create something that outlasts you, if that makes sense. Uh, but by the way, different universities have different ways of looking at this. I mean, some places might be more conservative and the way you do that might be discovering a new, a new method in math and explaining why it works. That's like a, a theorem and, and a proof. But there might be other, other things that you could do to leave a lasting impact. And I, I really enjoy working at Carnegie Mellon University, which is where I am, because it's one of the most entrepreneurial type of universities. I don't mean in terms of starting a business. I mean in terms of thinking, it's quite open-minded in terms of what does it mean to make impact? And in fact, it's in that broad lens that I actually usually operate. These days, the sorts of activities that I work on, unfortunately, every day is actually different. But that's because, um, as I've mentioned, I've been here for 11 years. I have a, I, I've built a certain track record here of doing lots of very strange things that might sometimes leave some impact, maybe like that quadratic method or something, or other things that I work on these days, if they happen to overlap, let's say, into healthcare or, and managing, or managing pandemics. But the main objective is to think, what are the kinds of things that you can do that will, of course, educate the students we have here, but also leave some lasting impact on human knowledge. So speaking of that lasting impact on human knowledge, you know, your particular area of focus is discrete mathematics and combinatorics. Now, I remember studying some discrete mathematics at university myself and, you know, sort of looking at the subject outline before I chose it and thinking, discrete mathematics, is this like secretive, like shh, mathematics. But of course, this is a very different kind of discrete. It's to do with whole numbers. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your, could you give us like a thumbnail sketch of the fields that you particularly work in? Oh, sure. So I think that 
if I, if I think about discrete mathematics, a lot of times that's bundled in with the study of networks. And the study of networks, there are lots of networks in the world. One of them might be the internet, which is what we're using to have this call right now. But another kind of network might be the network of human relationships, of who's spending time with who. And you could imagine if you watch some of those movies, sometimes they draw this big chart on a wall, which is that these people are around each other, those people are around each other, and so on. Now, the reason why there's a whole area of math around that is because if somebody just gave you a network, what would you do with it? You know, it's actually very messy. A network is just that I might have a billion people and some of them interacted with some other people. Is there any head or tail that you can make out of this mess? And in network theory, you'll realize that there might be some things that are useful. For example, it might be useful to consider for a person, how many people are they connected to? That's actually called the degree of a node. But the notions of, oh, if you have a network where the degrees are very high, what kind of consequences might that have? Turns out that that means that in such a network, there are more ways to go from like a, a node to another node. It, it, this is, of course, not really rigorous, but I'm saying like heuristically, the higher your degrees are, meaning like if on average every person has more, pe more connections out, then it's faster to kind of get from someone to someone else. But these kinds of notions you can turn into even writing proofs. For example, a, a, a famous result in network theory is if you have, and I, I wonder if this is actually in your book already, but it's somehow if you have any six people at a party and you make the network of who is spending time, who, who already knows who, it turns out that there's always going to be some three of them who are already this person knows this person, this person knows this person, and this person knows that person. Or if you can't find that, there'll be some three who they've never met, and they've never met, and they've never met. I, I, I'm almost positive you put that in your book, <laughs> because it's, it's famous. You're absolutely right, Poe. Uh, talking about network theory and that minimum number of six, um, I think the chapter in my book was called Six is a Crowd. Um, but that's, it is a very counterintuitive result. Um, and there are plenty in there that within network theory that are immensely related um, to you know, applications in a world, which we will get to shortly. Um, but I think it's really clear from what you've just said that you wanted to do more than just research and teach within a university context. And you were talking about um, Carnegie Mellon and its sort of entrepreneurial attitude. Um, so I wanted to talk about XP for a minute, E-X-P-I-I. This is something that uh, you founded, a company organization, um, and it's actually, for, for those of you who are watching at home, I think you should go and check out um, XP.com. There's sort of so many delightful resources there, um, but it's actually the name of it itself. I remember puzzling over it and then realizing this is actually something which is very personal to you. Could you just very briefly explain where the name comes from? Oh, so XP was a website that I and uh, actually a fellow student at Carnegie, not fellow student, one of my students at Carnegie Mellon, we had this idea that, you know, if you could make a website to try to explain lots of concepts in high school math and science, where it's not just, let's say, one person's explanation, but like all of the different best explanations we could find put into one place then this could be a useful resource because we had learned that people were often doing their homework by Googling for things. So we said, if you're using Google to find resources, Google's not the best at sorting the educational resources. So can we just make one free website where we have all of these different explanation videos that we've found on YouTube? I think that's how a lot of our team found you, by the way. <laughs> and, and, and you know all of, all of the most interesting ways in the world, put them there for a reason because not everyone, by the way, learns from videos. Some people like to learn from words. And so we, we actually had an objective of, Let's have videos, let's have written explanations, let's have pictures. Okay, but we had to come up with a name for that website. And, you know, we tried lots of different things. There's one problem on the internet these days. A lot of the names are already taken. Uh, but you want something short, right? So we thought five letters would be great. We thought about different kinds of word prefixes and suffixes. And XP sounded nice from the experience, EXP experience. But then what clinched it was when we realized that you can spell it EXPII, and then it would have a double meaning. You seem to be very sharp in figuring out what this double meaning is. It's the most beautiful equation in mathematics. It's the exponential of pi times i. So the name of the website is actually experience. E-X-P-I-I -I is pronounced X-P. It's experience points in many people's video games. But the way it's spelled is the E-X-P exp, e is the exponential of pi times I, Euler's formula. E to the power of pi times I and then plus one turns out to be zero. And this is the most beautiful equation in mathematics. 
I'm just so delighted hearing that explanation from you and that particularly that double meaning I think is delightful but actually you know you talking about uh, e to the power of pi i plus one equals zero Euler's uh, formula his identity like you were saying before that was actually the very first time that I encountered you there was a there's a sort of well-known video of you um, speaking in front of a blackboard and I'll give you an explanation for this delightful result and I remember thinking hmm I reckon this guy and I would get along really well. And, and that was many years ago, and I was right. Now, um, tell us more about, like you, you said, you're the founder. Um, you gave us this explanation for why you created it. It sort of curates a lot of these resources because, um, as you pointed out, you know, search engines out there, they do their very best to try and, you know, collate, you know, based on who links to who and who, which results are most popular and so on. Um, but you're obviously trying to do something quite different in the way that you've structured things. Um, I, I'm interested in how people have been using it because you know, XP is not new now. How have you been finding that actually people have been getting on and what benefits they've been getting from it? Yeah, again, the main purpose of making that website was just to deliver resources to people that they would possibly want. And so early on, well, not early on, in the middle of our progress, we did a lot of this user research of asking high school students, how do you try to do your homework? That's how we found out that everyone's Googling everything. So in fact, the vast majority of the people who drop on xp.com just come in because they were Googling something. And there's probably around a thousand topics in high school mathematics, uh, mainly algebra and high school science, mainly biology, where the top result in Google will actually be our page. And that's not because we paid Google anything. We don't have any money to pay Google anything. But it's because when our team is making those lessons, uh, what, we, what, our, what our objective is, is go and check everything on Google. Our goal is to deliver what the student wishes they could get in one go. Do you know what I mean? It's like we know what are all the free resources on the internet for this one topic in mathematics or science. How do we make what the student would go to and say, you know what, I'm really glad that this came because that's exactly what I wanted. That's perfect. It's sort of a one-stop shop, right? Now, um, I'm really interested because that is not the only thing that's on XP. And one of the things that you and I have talked about before, which was so immensely exciting to me when I first heard about, heard about it, was um, Project Spark. This is a little bit different. Could you explain to our viewers what's Project Spark about and what's the point of it? Oh, I have this crazy idea that it, you know, actually, it's funny I'm talking to you about this because it seems like you have the same crazy idea. But <laughs> I have this crazy idea that somehow everybody could learn mathematics if maybe the way that you look at things is different. If we don't need to think of mathematics as frightening. You don't need to think of mathematics as something that you can't do. In fact, if you think you can't do it, you can't do it. And, and so the, the goal of this Project Spark was, is there a way to help, help make mathematics something that more people can embrace? And maybe could we explain concepts in math in ways that are different from the usual po on a blackboard explaining something? Could it be maybe done in the course of a video of somebody trying to catch the bus? And well, there you go. The Pythagorean theorem tells you how much, uh, how much distance you get to save by taking a shortcut. But and that's actually one of the videos that we made. But we ultimately were just trying to take the way that you normally do education but maybe put a very human and entertaining spin on it in a way that's genuine and in a way that people can, uh, can, can gravitate to so that they can see themselves in the, in, the, in, the, in the mindset of somebody who can do math or science and then is also having a great life because of it. Hmm, that's fantastic. I, I'm so excited by what XP is achieving and it's very much like you said, um, my heart aligns so much with your mission. So I, I think, you know, all power to um, the work of you and your team. 